talking tonight all about cooperatives. Um, and I'd like to start this evening by acknowledging um, that tonight we meet on the lands of a number of First Nations people. Um, in my instance, I'm in Hepburn, Victoria, um, and it's the Jaja Warung people of the Kulin Nation. Um, but I can see tonight the participants will be meeting on the lands of many Indigenous nations. Um, and I'd like to note that their sovereignty over their lands were never ceded. Um, I can start by introducing myself. I am Amy Padgett. I am an ABSA committee member um, and I currently live at Miliadora in Hepburn, Victoria, at the beautiful uh, permacultural property of David Holmgren and Sue Dennett, which I've been lucky enough to call home during this COVID uh, pandemic. Um, in terms of ABSA, we're, an, we're a farmer-led organisation and we fight, the, we fight for the right to nourishing and culturally appropriate food grown and distributed in ethical and ecologically sound ways. Um, and, we, and along with our, with our right to uh, collectively determine our own food system. Uh, we're a body that organises fights for the rights of eaters and producers, both here and abroad. Um, and we can't do that without a strong and active member base. Um, and I know a lot of you tonight would be ABSA members, which we really appreciate. And if you aren't yet, we definitely need your voice um, to support our campaign. So it's really the only reason that we're sort of taken seriously and that we're heard when we speak to government um, and when we participate in food sovereignty work internationally. So I really encourage you to visit uh, absa.org.au um, and become a member if you'd like to join the, join the good fight. Um, so yes, this is our third session in our series. We have with us joining tonight Cam Walker from Friends of the Earth, um, along with Genevieve Fry, who's from the Friends of the Earth Food Co-op. And we also have Catherine Cunningham from Earth Worker Cooperative. So we're really appreciative um, of you three to join us tonight as our panel e experts in um, cooperatives. So I will um, first ask Cam Walker to please introduce yourselves. If you'd like to tell us who you are, um, where you're from, sort of which organization and, and what, you, what your organizations um, are involved in, in terms of the work you do. Sure, so my name's Cam. I live in Castlemaine on Jara country in central Victoria and uh, have been working with Friends of the Earth for a long while now. And we have a, quite a long history here in Australia. Jen will talk about the co-op, which was set up in 1975, but uh, it started in the early 1970s. It always had a very strong focus on understanding the fact that overconsumption was a, a core driver of the ecological crisis and that we needed systemic change rather than just window dressing and better reform of or regulation of environmental problems. So we've always had quite a, I would argue, quite a deep uh, analysis of the problems we face. And a big part of that has been seeking to create organisational structures that reflect the type of world that we want to live in. And for that reason, we, we have a flat decision making structure, we're non hierarchical, we consider ourselves pro feminist and intersectional in our approach, we're very internationalist. So yeah, we're a little bit different to the rest of the large uh, environmental non government organisations. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And Genevieve, over to you. So yeah, I'm Genevieve, and I work at the Friends of the Earth Food Co-op. I feel very grateful that I get to work there. It's a pretty incredible place. I've been there for 15 years now. Um, and like Cam oh. said, it's been going um, since 1975, which is a long time. Um, it's a real institution in Collingwood, where it is um, in Birrarunga. And it, um, I guess part of what I do there, I'm a cook, but then I'm also a coordinator, which means I sit with the core body of people that help to make decisions about the co-op collectively. And um, those decisions are to keep the co-op um, buoyant and thriving and that kind of thing. Um, yeah. Wonderful, thank you. And over to you, Catherine. Hi, I'm Catherine Cunningham. I'm from Earthworker. Um, I'm on both the board of Earthworker and Earthworker Energy Manufacturing Cooperative. So Earthworker has been around since the 80s, the green bands, uh, with a space between the environmental movement and the union movement. Um, we have a core cooperative, Earthworker, uh, that has then a number of smaller cooperatives from it. So Earthworker Energy Manufacturing, 
Earthworker uh, uh, Red Gum, which is another uh, cleaners cooperative. Hope, which is working with refugees. Cooperative Power, which we're part of. Um, and we're just starting up um, Earthworker Power, Community Power, which is building a relationship between housing and, and renewable energy in Melbourne. Yay. And what a breadth of work that you're involved in. It's really quite something. <laughs> um, and hopefully, yeah, we can find out a little bit more about those uh, further down the chat. Um, Cam, I guess it'd be good to start with you in, in, the, um, in the flat structure that you mentioned earlier on. If you can sort of explain maybe what co -op, how co-ops operate in general and how important that flat, stru flat structure is. Yeah, sure. So pretty much through our history, we've helped establish cooperatives. And part of that, just to kind of backtrack for a minute, is, you know, our understanding that the system isn't working for people, that ne the neoliberal model basically outsources all the problems, it, internal it, it internalises the profits, but socialises the costs. Um, it's really bad for climate, it's really bad for nature, and it's really bad for people. So a, a, a core understanding of what we've done is to seek to kind of create better structures and we understand that we need to run businesses in order to survive it but we love the model of co-ops because it means that they, if they're not for profit the benefits either go back to the membership or to the community and we think that that's really important because then what that does is rem remove the profit imperative and kind of incorporates solidarity with everything that that, that implies around community and, and neighbourliness and, and conviviality and mutual aid and it kind of puts that at the core of the economic model we use rather than the profit imperative. So we've, we've run a whole series of co-ops over the years. Most of them have run as workers cooperatives and probably apart from the food co-op in Melbourne, the other main one is um, a workers owned cooperative in Brisbane called Reverse Garbage. So it's basically a reuse depot. It's in metropolitan Brisbane and it finds in effect waste e.g. building materials and then finds a market for it and it has more than 10 employees at present it's been going since i think about 1999 and then we've run a series of, of kind of smaller co-ops and we also ran a fruit and veggie cooperative probably for about 15 years um, that ran parallel to the friends earth one in melbourne uh, it was in the same suburb but it focused more on locally produced organic veggies Fantastic. Just before I um, ask Catherine a question, can everyone who's in the audience please make sure that you mute your microphones just so it's, it's nice and clear for us to hear um, the panellists speak. Um, Catherine, from what you mentioned, um, the organisations or the, the campaigns for Earth Worker are, um, are worker co cooperatives as well. And, and I know that the Energy Manufacturing Cooperative is, is the first worker-owned factory in Australia. Are you, would you are you happy to share with us um, a little bit of info about that um, and and how you see uh, how important it is for it to be worker owned and sure um, so Morwell the, the the factory we have in Morwell is um, manufacturing stainless steel tanks to go with heat pumps and, and evacuator tubes uh, it's a very powerful design it's quite a well insulated tank which makes it quite a um, Quite a strong, good product. Uh, it's a great product, I think, for a manufacturing, a worker-owned cooperative to own. Um, we're participating in the renewable industry. And, I mean, and being in Morwell, yeah, it's about reframing what Morwell's journey has been um, away from Hazelwood. Now we have no uh, shifting on all of that, that conversation that was taking place there. But the worker-owned cooperative means that the people who do the work own the work. Yeah, and owning your means of production means that you've got the capacity to make all those really quite across the board decisions about how you're going to go about doing what you're doing. So as Cam was saying, the thing about the difference in a cooperative is that when they're non-dividend paying, when they're not paying out um, the, the, that margin, that profit margin to shareholders or to, to, to the marketplace, it stays inside. It stays inside the community, it stays inside where the people are doing the work. And there's, so the difference, the core difference is that it's not extracted. So morwell has been an entire township that's been extracted, yeah? And so many, so many human beings have been 
eaten up and chewed up and spat out by that machine of, of capitalism that is, um, that is, yeah, and spat out more than that as well as, as the actual landscape that is more well as well. And I think recently just watching um, a couple of the major organisations like Target and Coles decide to leave, I think it was Coles decide to leave as well. So that, that company control that people have on people's lives is the thing that the, the, the worker on cooperative can take back. You can take that back and say, actually, no, I'm in charge of my life and my, and my work and how I'm doing my work. Um, the worker-owned cooperative that is uh, early digital manufacturing has, is just still just beginning. It was still, we've just, we've pretty much proved a concept. We've got good sales. Um, we've got some sales coming through, just enough to kind of with the, the amount of people we have on board so far. So we're just in that about to expand mode. Okay. So, which is a tricky part. <laughs> I think anytime something's growing, you've got that first moving parts and then you've got to grow it. So, just yeah. Which Red Gum is feeling at the moment too. So, I think Red Gum, the cleaning cooperative, has been through some working that, again, cleaning is a notoriously exploited environment. There's a lot of people get um, that. And there's that middleman, yeah, that happens in there. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So, and, and, but then, I mean, so when you work for yourself, you don't play the middleman, but if you work for yourself, it's, it's kind of lonely and you're kind of at risk when you're out there on your own. Whereas if you've got a cooperative, a group of you working together, then you've, you've built, so you've got you've got support. You've got you know people you're working with alongside. Mm -hmm. and so cleaning is cleaning is cleaning, yeah. But a worker-owned cooperative of cleaners means that everyone gets paid really well, yeah. And they're looked after, and they make sure the cleaning the the products they're using are environmentally friendly. They make sure no one's putting themselves or working themselves to death, yeah. So mm -hmm. there's no, yeah. But you do the other part of that with cooperatives is that you do need to become your own. You need to participate in the management. Yeah, you need to be part of the thing that says this is how the work's going to get done. So, you know, that, that part of us when we show up to work or we need someone to tell us what to do next, we need to take a little bit of that responsibility back, yeah, and say, well, I know what needs to happen next. And I need to, yeah, I'm participating in this on such a level because I own this. So I, the vested interest, it's a very different thing than, than, say, you know, showing up for a boss. and For sure. And, yeah. Or going to work, yeah, in a corporation. Yeah. Yeah, in a question. So, so um, speaking to that sort of co-creation um, element and, and the idea of eliminating the middleman, it'd be great to hear from Genevieve um, the experience that the co-op, the experience of the co-op during COVID-19 in terms of um, the, the aim to remove the middleman for uh, what are, for, for the food sources that you were bringing into Melbourne. Um, how important was the food co-op during the time of, of crisis? Um, yeah, it's, it's been really such an interesting time to be working um, as, a, as a collective, as a cooperative and dealing with all of the shifts and changes that, you know, everyone's been going through in different ways. Um, I think it really has shown to me the strength of collective decision making and cooperative decision making being that you can really quickly um, and uh, you can quickly make decisions and be really agile with those decisions, um, which has been hugely beneficial. Um, so we were able to adjust our business model quite quickly to put a heavy emphasis on groceries and take away the emphasis from the cafe. Um, in those initial weeks when people were not leaving the house. Um, so doing things like that um, and being able to do that kind of quickly helped sustain the, the business because even though it is a co-op and obviously we're not for profit, you still are functioning as, as a business. You need to pay your overheads, you need to pay your bills um, and you're all working together to make sure that what you're doing is sustainable um, in those constraints. And so, yeah, that was, um, I think, really amazing to watch the co-op um, really pull together and make those changes, Be, being able to just instantly implement um, sanitization changes and all of those kinds of things um, to make sure the customers feel safe. Uh, was a really important thing. In terms of 
getting rid of uh, the like middle people in the buying process, we kind of, um, we, we don't do a lot of direct farmer but purchasing. We do have some and some people come to us directly, but not a large amount. Um, predominantly we do work through the fruit and veggie wholesale markets in Melbourne um, and the organic and biodynamic markets, um, which continued to operate throughout that period. So there wasn't a lot of change there. Um, we, we, we did work quite closely with our suppliers to maintain, um, and I guess, I guess our suppliers are on the smaller scale of things as well. And this mm -hmm. is one of the benefits of being in a smaller cooperative organization versus say Coles or Woolworths where all the toilet paper in the past has gone. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. We're working with much smaller supply chains. So we actually found that we had access through our suppliers pretty much the whole time to both those products, Fantastic. Um, which was amazing. And a lot of our suppliers we've been working with for 20 plus years. Um, so we have really good close long-term relationships with them, particularly with biodynamic marketing. Um, and yeah, so, you know, having that community network of, of suppliers, having um, that long-term relationship really helped us to all support each other through this period and help each other as best we could. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, incredibly, the supply chain remained pretty okay <laughs> throughout most of the time, which is, yeah, amazing. Fantastic. I mean, you've really highlighted a few of the key um, characteristics of, of a cooperative in that, um, in, their, in their ability to pivot and change. And, and that was great to hear the example where, you know, you, you would have had a focus on a cafe because you're on the, in the main drag of, you know, Collingwood, Melbourne. That's where you're going to get a lot of sort of throughput. But then in a time like this, decisions can be made quickly to sort of turn towards what, what the members sort of need. And, and, um, and that's, yeah, definitely what, what a co-op can do. And in terms of the hygiene as well, you're not waiting for some top down, you know, protocol process manual to be delivered. It's, it's you know, there's the ability to, to um, act quickly. Um, and also good to hear that, yeah, your, your supply chains remained um, flowing and that the emphasis on relationships, I'm guessing a key there, if, if you've been in business that long, um, you know, they're going to they're gonna be there to serve you and, and get, what, get you what you need as a priority. Um, I'd like to just ask Cam for his general, general um, insight and overview on how does collectivising sort of give us more power um, in times of sort of, uh, in times of change or, or in times of challenge? In many ways. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I think, you know, we know that, um, you know, to use the ecological perspective, like if you compare a pine plantation and an indigenous grassland, they're profoundly different because a pine plantation is a monoculture and mm -hmm. a native ecosystem is diverse and it has a whole bunch of different actors playing different roles. And the more complex an ecosystem is, the more robust it is and the more it's able to uh, build resilience or retain resilience and deal with external shocks. Mm -hmm. So in terms of collective structures, um, small, large, you know, in kind of cooperative, like uh, community owned, they all build a sense of resilience, if that makes sense. So our mm -hmm. co-op is relatively large in that we've got, you know, several thousand members of Friends of Earth Melbourne, uh, but different, different co-ops are going to fill different niches, if that makes sense. And I think mm -hmm. one of the really important things about co-ops is because they're generally owned locally, they're responsible to their local community. Uh, be that geographically or their community of interest, but they're also attuned more to what their local environment is offering. So Jen was talking about uh, biodynamic marketing, which I think is up in Paltown in the Upper Yarra, like what, you know, is able to be found in our region is going to be different to what will be found in North Queensland. So mm -hmm. I think there's a, a built-in kind of ecological and, and social resilience that comes with co-ops. 
Mm -hmm. And because everyone is empowered, as Catherine said, you know, everyone needs to kind of sit at the table and be involved. It also means you're very responsive because as external forces change, you're, you're not waiting for someone in Singapore or someone in Sydney to, you know, work it down through the chain. If you see something, you engage and therefore you're able to kind of bring about change in how the organisation works. So I, I see co-ops as the perfect model for a time of climate change because I feel like they're close to the ground. People are there because they want to be there, not just because they're being paid. You know, it's it's about the, the greater good. It's about the cohesion. It's about the solidarity. It's not just around the paycheck. And that mm -hmm. really changes how people deal with adversity as well. Mm -hmm. And I guess as we are sort of faced with economically and, you know, environmentally challenging times ahead, um, I guess it'd be good to hear from, I, 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 I'd like to ask Catherine because she has, you know, been involved in so many co-ops, but um, it'd be great to hear like what goes into setting up a co-op um, and what, uh, what, what should be chosen above um, other ways, like why, why should a co-op be chosen instead of other ways of organising? Are you still there, Catherine? Yep, I'm still here. Ah, oh, beautiful. Yeah, I just went and jumped, I put a jumper on, it's much colder here, suddenly. Um, okay, so uh, the how the cooperative, I think, is huge. I think there's, there's yeah. lots of different, there's a lot, there's a huge thing in it. But um, essentially, I, personally, I feel it's about, it's about right livelihood. It's about you doing the work you want to do um, and, and perhaps in a way, and Cam just hit it on it before when you're saying, when you show up to a, something, you, it's worker owned, there is that so much more personal investment. You, are, you aren't just showing up for a job, you're doing something that, that you hopefully really love to do. And I think passion and uh, living in a, a state of passion, living with life that really turns you on is actually what the earth needs the most now. Just she doesn't need so many of the successful people, really just really honest, good humans is what she needs, <laughs> who really love what they do. And, and, and right actions with the earth as well. I think if the work that you're doing is something that you can question your actions and you can do the work. But I think the going ahead and building a cooperative, though, isn't necessarily uh, an easy thing to do in our current, I think in the current way we've been pretty much trained from, you know, to sit on the map from the beginning, yeah? From, mm -hmm. from kindergarten, we've been told to wait and do as we're told mm -hmm. and sit on the mat. And then, and we have lots of different moments where we, where we get it right, yeah? And lots of compliance moments and lots of movements through that. So the idea of doing something um, like a cooperative seems quite outside the, the mainstream, quite outside the normal. And you do have to find um, quite powerful communication skills. Uh, and um, and be quite responsible for your emotional state too. You need to show up and and be response able, yeah, able to respond to to the situation, not necessarily reactive. Mm -hmm. um, you need to be, and, and I think vision and holding vision and sharing vision is another big part of cooperatives. I think having similar vision and, and solid values is another big part of cooperatives. You're actually, sharing those types of things that make. Um, make the living inside and the doing of the work a really beautiful and enjoyable experience yeah and i think that when we prioritize that in our cooperatives we make a we make for a different experience again than than the normal what we put up with at work yeah the the things that we, we kind of just make to do or make okay or like the culture that we create inside a cooperative is a far more um responsive situation than the culture inside a company yeah Mm. And, the, and we're going to work. And you, you, you can be so much, you can create so much more. But I think the, the core of building really strong cooperatives is to have something that you all believe in, like something you, as a business idea, and it has to be a viable business, yeah? It's, it can't be something that might work one day. It needs to be a viable business because any business, and, and as a choice, the, why would you choose a cooperative to run a viable business is because mm -hmm. the type of ownership that you have there I think it's. I think there's a reason why people become self-employed, yeah, and run their own show. And but I think the collective version of that is the cooperative. So there's some people who want to do it on their own and who are far better in life if they're on their own. And there's other people who actually prefer and really want to work together, want to work in community, um, but want to work, but still want to own it, yeah, still want to have that ownership level to it. So the cooperative as a business vessel. Um, in lots of ways is that shared ownership but 
because all of that ownership is it stays in the community the cash and the cash flow that's built often stays quite quite close to the ground in the grassroots area if it's a dividend paying then you all decide how much and what type of payment you're going to give yourself at the end of the year with those profits if it's a non-dividend paying then those profits just go straight back in and you keep building often cooperatives will start as a non-dividend paying and then maybe one year maybe sometimes they'll just become dividend paying for one year but mm -hmm. this i think the thing about um the worker owned cooperative is that the, that is key is communication yeah being able to do consensus and to me consensus is a real key idea and that is that um if you stay with the consensus process what you end up with is the is the is the answer the result that everyone really agrees is the right way to go that's what consensus means yeah it's in, in and in opposition to can you just sort of explain what the usual decision making process is often you do decision making process is, is a vote if there, if there is a vote or if it's a top down yeah um mm -hmm. so sometimes it's just three people make a decision for 600 people yeah and when three people make decisions for 600 people there's no way that they can be in relationship full relationship with 600 people and it's not mm -hmm. that um every single decision the the cooperative makes has to go through consensus often we do break into smaller community spaces and that they do but the process of consensus is about finding the best and most effective answer to whatever situation you're dealing with whatever problem mm -hmm. it is you, mm -hmm. you've got all the heads involved and everyone's engaged and then once everyone's engaged and going, we all, we all agree that that's the best way forward, then everyone's the shoulder to the wheel on that one. Everyone will, will do the work that needs to happen to get that done. Whereas if you've got a 60-40, 60 believe it's and 40 are against, then you've got a, you're up against 40%, yeah? And you don't, and that 40% doesn't necessarily help with the movement forward. Whereas consensus helps with that and, and sometimes it's you, you, there's just people who just don't vote and they just they just abstain and they just say because I don't I, I don't care either way or I don't feel qualified or it's not relevant for me to respond. So then that's but that's a really different place than blocking or, or being against something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if, if everyone who counts is in in agreement, then that consensus makes for a very powerful movement forward. And then, yeah, and accessing at each time, then you, then you know that you can move forward quite powerfully. Fantastic. I think there were lots of pearls of wisdom in there. So thank you so much for sharing, <laughs> Catherine. You're obviously very, very experienced. There's um, a question that's come through on the chat. Uh, Joe is asking, are there many different co-op governance models? Uh, dividend paying, staffed, not staffed. Yes. Um, so the so dividend. Uh, sorry, which was which one were we looking at then? Uh, uh, governance models. Yeah, are, are, are there different ways to structure a co-op, and and can that sort of be so, you know defined by the members? It can be. Um, I think you can definitely you as the, as the group of people when you go to build your cooperative you build your rules yeah and the rules and the rules builder on bccm.com um, maybe .com.au but um bccm has a, a powerful tool that they've made available called a, a rules builder yeah and you walk through the the construction of a cooperative rule set and you build the way you want to build your cooperative and, and how you want to do the governance is in there there's a number of different um, examples of how that do, how that it can happen um you can, i mean like, like any organization you can run silos or not run silos you can run um guild, different moving parts of your organization depending on how large you are and what you're trying to achieve yeah mm -hmm. if you've got um and the factory we've got obviously got a floor we've got the office we've got sales We've got different moving parts, but it's a good idea for everyone to have a good idea of what's happening in each of those departments, yeah? And it's not that everyone on the floor makes decisions about marketing. It, and in fact, they don't want to. But um, it, it's more about um, but people being able, understanding enough, a little bit enough, um, to, to make, to, 
to participate to whatever level that they can or, or is necessary, yeah? There's different ways. I think it depends on the, the group of people and the activity that the business is doing, yeah? If you're all cleaners, then you've got a different story than if you're working in a factory and you've got people on the floor and people in different ways and there's, yeah. The Rule Builder link, I will, um, I will make sure I get the right thing and I'll put it in the chat box in a minute. Yes, that would be fantastic. Appreciate yeah. it. Um, cool. Great. And just a general question, whoever would like to answer, um, what are issues to look out for or advice for anyone embarking on establishing a co-op? Just two quick ones for me is to think about your decision making process and really do that front end work. So not get on with building the co-op, but get on first with building your decision making structures and develop a sense of what culture you want to have um, in the organisation. So for us, our culture of looking out for each other, nothing else will work if that isn't in place. So yeah, do the front end work rather than the kind of, you know, getting getting the doors open in a material sense, focus mm -hmm. on the internal culture and decision making first, I reckon. Mm -hmm. Great. And anything you'd like to add, Genevieve? Just trying to think. Um... I yeah, I think it what Cam said is is great and I'm I because I wasn't part of that, I've like walked into this thing that's already set up and I can see that that decision making, the processes that are already there behind that are so important. Um and I think Catherine already said this as well, but having the same vision and having that really strong and clear and what you're trying to achieve and the same values i think that needs to be pretty aligned and important as well um yeah fantastic the questions are coming in so if anyone who's written a question would like to turn their mic and their camera on and ask it it would be great to hear from you perhaps if um Martin and Sally would like to ask their question. It pertains to food, which is great because obviously this is an, an ABSA sort of um, an ABSA session. So Martin or Sally, please go ahead. You're actually still on mute. There you go. Perfect. Yeah, we're just after an idea of what a uh, co-op's uh, co idea would be for the future. And if you're looking at starting a co-op, would you look at all components of it and look at um, what can sustain that into the future rather than looking um, to create a co-op that can work for an outside community. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, I mean, if you can just summarise your question and, and feel free to, to, to direct it to one of the panellists if you think someone um, might, have the, might have an idea of the answer. Well, whoever wants to answer it. But um, rather than creating a co-op, that's doing a small amount of work for an, an external community, would you look at um, creating all the components within a co-op that can sustain the co-op into the future? So for it to be sort of more built around the members' needs as opposed to serving another community? Yes. Yeah, so if you're making something that's going to be sustainable into the future, would you look at food production, um, housing. Right, like like uh, focusing on a on a particular industry or or a, or something that they see worthwhile moving yeah, forward. More of a a more social network rather than yeah external. Um, looking for it's like creating something like a, a community based operation that could sustain itself, like a, creating each component. Within it. Maybe you can. Maybe Cam. Okay. I feel like Cam's got a lot of experience. Yeah, I, I think um, it's kind of like horses for courses. It depends on what you want to do. So with Friends of Earth Melbourne, we are very outward facing in that it's about the community that we exist in and we exist in a geographical area, which is that inner north. Do you know what I mean? So we're very accountable to our community and then we try and align that with our internal culture to make sure that we're operating in a really effective way so you know i saw that note there from ant in harcourt you know if, if you're producing food 
you know, in a region like Harcourt, the reality will be very different. So I'm a big fan of not having a cookie cutter approach to developing co-ops, but taking an ecological perspective to developing co-ops, which is what is this local community? What are its realities? What are the opportunities? And then in effect, building the architecture once you've answered those questions. I don't, I hope that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, but at a basic level, all communities require the same thing. True. So starting from your food production and then going out from there, would yep. you look at um, would you look at creating a co-op that first of all is creating your food and then creating um, other elements that coming from your food production and then maybe structures housing from there? Yeah, start small and build. I, I remember I, I forget what it's called, but the original the big black hard copy you know permaculture manual that that was done you know in went way back when i remember in the back it had this fantastic list of these are all the things that a functioning community needs from you know a baker's to a to a builder's and i reckon that becomes in a, it's a really good list and i reckon you go to it and you go well where is the gap so if there's 15 builders in that in a small town there's no point having a builder's co-op but if there's no bakers then you know, again, you, you go, oh, well, let's set up a baker's co-op if that's the skills we have. So I think, yeah, very much start small. Think of it as like Lego almost, you know, build the building blocks. You don't create the house straight away. You build the foundations. Foundations in a community, I think, is normally food because everyone needs food. And then you go out from there through the hierarchy of, you know, needs in terms of more expendable, you know, money that's, that's more, you know, able to be discerned. I hope that makes sense. The food shelter friends. Yeah, exactly. More adapt, yeah, exactly. Adapt to the existing community and what an existing community needs rather than if you're creating a co-op that would have all the components that an existing community would have to try yeah. to um, to try to get that co-op to build. So you could do uh, your food production, um, like your growing of vegetables, your animal production, your fibres, medicine and doing something like that. So you're building a whole cooperative that is using everything that they possibly can to uh, build and spread and grow. Yeah, maybe, yep. Thank you, thank you for that, Martin. Um, so if we understand that co-ops are sort of the original for, form um, of working collaboratively, um, Douglas has asked a question saying, why are worker cooperatives not more mainstream? <laughs> Yeah, okay. maybe, and maybe can I can I maybe qualify that question a little bit more? Yeah, too? please, please. Yeah, yeah, cool. Um, so I mean, I've I've been just doing a little bit of, I've been kind of tangentially involved in, in you know cooperative kind of, um, I guess uh, there's a various kind of uh, just reading and being involved in people who are actually doing and working in cooperatives, and that's some some of the questions that keep coming up for me is just around um, conceptually they make so much sense. And, and I'm just curious as to why they're not more mainstream. It seems like they should be. And I'd just like to know if anybody had any thoughts on if there's any, any specific kind of structural or systemic barriers that people should be wary of when they think about the viability of a cooperative entity versus another type of a, a business. I, I think in general terms, capitalism hates cooperatives. You know, it's, it's, yep. like you can't <laughs> hate it. they will do what they can to make it hard. From time to time, there have been state governments that have facilitated the establishment of workers' carts, but generally it's anathema to capitalism. And mainstream media derides them and thinks there's some anachronism or some kind of, you know, anarchist utopia. So culturally, yeah. we've got everything working against us, and there's not many prominent examples so people might say oh yeah what about mondragon you know but it's like what are the local ones and it's very hard to name them so i think also if unless you have a model it's it's you know you, you can be what you can see to use that analogy but there's there's not very much to see here in victoria probably earthworker is becoming the thing to be the thing to aspire to because 
it is functioning and it does have a physical, you know, brick and mortar building and it's actually doing old school manufacturing as well. It's doing, you know, real jobs. But the, yeah, they, they're the three problems. The, the capitalist system hates it. The Murdoch press hates them and derides them wherever they're mentioned and delights in their failure. Um, and there's not many good examples for us to follow. Mm. Also, also um, they are hard to invest in. And we're only just getting capital credits, uh, uh, um, corporate credits, that kind of thing. So, so normally when a business um, begins, they often need startup cash and startup funds. That's a really hard thing. Unless the actual people who are arriving to build the cooperative have got the funds, it's a harder thing to get your funding for. Another part of it is we've only just had a Senate inquiry, inquiry um, a few years back that actually really went through the legal structures that cooperatives are living inside of to try and um, reduce some of the red tape because there were some insane levels of con control and contain, which is exactly, and, and the reason why is exactly what Camden said, because capitalism hates cooperatives, yeah? So when we were living, um, you know, we were coming out just pre-industrial age, yeah, we, there was lots of cooperatives. So all, everything ran on cooperatives. We all, that was the functioning way. And um, even 100 years ago in this country, cooperatives were the functioning way. But the more and more the corporation wants and needs control, the less and less co um, cooperatives are going to be seen. And, and, the, and the other thing Cam just said, reflection. We don't see them in our culture. I did a, um, a Bachelor of Business at RMIT and in entrepreneurship, and I didn't even hear the word cooperative. That it was never even mentioned. <laughs> it was. It's not a viable situation, and and because we don't, we're not. It's not reflected. We don't talk about it in high school. It's not an option. That's like you don't grow up and think I want to go and join a co-op or I want to go and build a co-op. It's just not on the radar. It's not a possibility. <laughs> so yeah, and I mean, it'd be great to see more um, financial capacity, building more grants and building more capacity to create investment is a big one too. Because manufacturing takes a lot of cash. Yeah. So that's another part why we don't. It, it, it also seems there's a lot there's a lack of professional services, uh, people that are, are trained in cooperatives. So accountants, mm. lawyers, I've, I've come across in, in trying to you know start start my cooperative up or the, you know, yeah. others, and it's just there's just a lack of knowledge yeah, around. It. It's really frustrating because people actually because they don't know about it, they'll try to talk you out of that structure in yeah. some cases. They will. You know? Yeah. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Thanks for that, Douglas. That was super interesting. Um, I've got Ant and Louise Sales both firing a few questions. So if one of you would like to jump on and ask the question directly, the floor is yours. <laughs> so I'll, um, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I can do that. So yeah, I had, I had a couple of questions. One was, do you think there's an upper limit to in size for a functioning cooperative? And also, there were, there did used to be some quite big agricultural cooperatives like Murray Goldburn. I was just wondering why you think they've waned in recent years. Murray Goldburn was taken down, like it was, it was dismantled. <laughs> yeah, and again, it was dismantled because it was, it was sovereignty. Yeah, a whole bunch of beautiful farmers were doing their thing and owning their land and doing their right, th doing things. But I mean, you can see in, in big scale agriculture, that's, that's, that's what's happening out there in the big scale agriculture. They just keep buying up the small farms, yeah? And owning more and more. So um, to, for smaller groups to, and smaller farmers to hold their ground, in actual fact, a cooperative is a really powerful way of doing that um, and to own their own and just to build the cooperatives. But, but they do have to, they were demutualized, which is actually the reason why Earthworker has taken the time to build what we have built, which is our central cooperative is a non-dividend paying cooperative. And all of our satellite cooperatives, all of our small cooperatives are members of us. We, we, caught, we centralize our IP and we centralize our earnings. It also helps us um, generate grants and those sorts of things for our smaller cooperatives. But what it means is that it's much, much harder to demutualize demutualize us so we can become you, like can you explain what demutualized is sorry i don't know the history to this so the demutualized just means that um so it, it just it's about getting everybody to agree um it, getting the cooperative to say basically to sell off yeah it's to sell off the things it's a, it's a corporation comes along and says we've got a great deal for you and they get everyone to, or in the end, agree that it's time to sell on or to let go or to, to, to let the, yeah, 
it's basically demutualising is a, is the way that a cooperative um, closes shop and lets go and and hands on over and and sells off. Um, and so the demutualising process is what we have built because we'd have to, you'd have to have for any one of our little cooperatives to demutualise, you'd have to have the whole of our organisation to agree to it. So that makes for even if there's, you know, 20 people in, in, on the ground, if they want to demutualise back to us, different story, yeah, into the, into the earth worker ecosystem. But to demutualise to other and to, to let another company come in and take them over, that's the thing that we're protecting ourselves against by doing that. Because, I mean, it may, it may just get to a place where, you know, no one makes fax machines anymore for a reason. Like, technology moves on. <laughs> so sometimes if we've got... And, I mean, we find that with Mondragon, yeah, they... Uh, the other question I think you had about the size, how big can cooperatives get? Um, Mondragon's mm -hmm. got tens of thousands of people involved in their, in their cooperatives. But they are, and they do like $16 billion per annum, yeah? As, but they are a huge organisation of cooperatives, yeah? But in the centre, owned by a company, that all of their members own that company. Only people who are a cooperative member can own that company. So it can't be owned by, it's not... It's not listed on the stock market. It's a private company. So they hire the CEO, they hire the management, and these guys, but they've got universities, they've got um, auto shops, manufacturing, bakeries, all foods, food and housing, everything inside this huge organisation. Um, the, it's Mondragon, M-O-N-D-R-A, Dragon, Mondragon. <laughs> In, it's in the Basque country in Spain, and they are um, they're in a more yeah they're they and they are quite uh, but they are you know in Spain and been going for some seventy something years so that there's a bit of a difference I think in where, and when we look to them I think there can be a bit of a trap there because that's this not Australia Australia is here and we've got a really different culture and um, and I think we're up against some different types of things in our culture. To, to get to it. Does that help? On, yeah. Sorry, Cam, yeah, go. Uh, I was just thinking just on that, how many people can be involved. I, I um, the longer I've been around, I've, I've come to the thinking that there's this magic number between seven and 20 people. If you've only got two or three people, you've got a couple of friends or co-workers, whereas once you've got seven, you've got culture, you've got group culture, you'll always have, you know, two groups or, or whatever. Once you get beyond 20, you can't really have informed collective decision-making. If, mm -hmm. you, if you're going to have 20, everyone needs to be really well trained and very mindful about good decision-making. But I reckon mm -hmm. that's, that's a target to move towards. And if you get more active people in that, then what you do is you practice subsidiarity where you specialise your decision-making down. So, for instance, in Friends of Melbourne, there's an operations collective of seven people. They make their decisions about operations. There's the food cop that make their decisions. There's the campaigners that make their decisions. And then while they're all independent, we then share what we're doing monthly through a, a single strategy meeting that is a larger meeting. But, yeah, I think you, you go... You go to, for a group that's large enough, it can have a culture, but not too large, it becomes unwieldy. And as you grow, you you create, and we call it the rise zone mm. model, you kind of, in effect, you know, brand, break mm. into branches and kind of create new nodes. Mm. Um, can I just add as well, I feel like that's also about, like, the size comes back to the sustainability of the co-op and that it's not so much about growth. It's about sustaining what's there and um, keeping the vision and keeping um, the ethics and the ethos of, of mm. the organisation rather than continually expanding. And I think, I'm, I'm not sure, but I, I'd say that co-ops maybe have a more nat a, a naturally slower growth um, which is actually a really great thing because that's much more sustainable than having really huge growth that you then kind of have to manage. Um, yeah. I, I think um, cooperatives have got more capacity to be growth agnostic, um, which is a term Kate Rowworth uses in, in Dermot Economics. And growth agnostic means my, our purpose for existence is not to grow. We don't have to grow. We don't have to earn more this quarter than we did last quarter. And that, to me, 
I think that's a really different imperative in business. I think if, you're, if your intention in business is to do good work and to build good things and to have a good experience in doing so and you know that you're doing good things for your community, then if those are your priorities, that's a really different thing than grow at all costs, right? Which is what capitalism does. It grows at all costs. Fantastic. Thanks so much for your contributions. Oh, we've had so many people mention on the chat. And do you want to jump on and ask a question? Or is your internet terrible? And shall I ask it on your behalf? My, can you hear me? My internet might yeah. be terrible. I won't, I won't turn my video on uh, for that reason. But yeah, it was just um, wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the economics and, and sort of capitalism and maybe neoliberalism or whatever it is that why this capitalism not doesn't like cop you know that was said a few times and just wondering if you could expand on that i i think because in australia with the liberal party we have the it's almost like a fairy tale that you know where we're a nation of, of small business owners you know the mums and dads that run the milk bars but in reality that's not true you know we're in reality our economic and political system is driven by very large transnational corporations. Yes. And the interests of the transnational corporations are completely represented by the ruling class, both Labor and Liberal, both of whom are deeply aligned in world views between corporations and, and those two main parties. And you only just have to look at the revolving door of people who are politicians and then they leave and three minutes later, they're a lobbyist for a gas company or for a mining company or whatever. It's a revolving door. Now, those people tend to be, in my experience, it's not that they're necessarily ideological and, you know, hate progressive ideas or anything, but they have a world view that is that there are correct ways to do things. And they have an inherent and I would say almost a religious belief in the market, being able to deliver the best outcomes for the community. And they see that cooperatives are essentially a distortion of the market because they're bringing other values beyond the profit imperative into the economic system. And it's kind of like, it's like the wrong ends of the magnet. You know, they kind of push each other away. So mm -hmm. not necessarily that they hate co-ops, but it's just, it doesn't feel right for them. And so they'll never do any legislation or policy work to make it easy for co-ops to establish themselves. So then the climate that we live in, it may not be overtly hostile to setting up cooperatives, but it tends to make reporting very onerous um, and governance structures very onerous in terms of the requirements. So it's kind of like, um, you know, it's, it's a, an, an unintended consequence of the views of the people that manage and run our society. That would be my my take on it. Perfect. Great answer. Thank you. Does anyone else have anything to add? <laughs> no, why would I? It was perfect. <laughs> uh, thank you. Great. Um, I might just jump to Max, who asked a question earlier. Max, if you'd like to ask it or I can read it out. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm actually just quite intrigued. That there's been quite a few significant failures in co-ops particularly food co-ops um and I'm, I'm just quite intrigued on your take on what some of the the kind of the big picture causes are where does it crash and burn and i'm not like murray goldman is one particular example which i'm familiar with but i'm thinking more of food cooperatives that have a, a significantly higher level of input from producers and consumers so less less commercial I don't know as much about food co-ops as, say, genders. <laughs> um, I, uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I think um, there are a lot of challenges. I mean, we've been talking about all the positives of co-ops, but there are certainly challenges. And I think Catherine said earlier that you need to have a business model that's going to work and be sustainable like you um that's so important if your business isn't sustainable the co-op is not going to be sustainable it doesn't matter how much people work and how much they put into it if it's not you know economically viable in some form 
um, and that ec economy doesn't have to be necessarily monetary, you know, you could be bartering or you could be doing other things, but there needs to be a, some kind of balance that you can, um, that you can, you can balance the books, basically, you need to be able to sustain the, the people working in it, they need to live, um, they need to feed themselves and house themselves. So uh, I, I would say that because it is challenging to run food related business, um, potentially that is, is the issue. Um, yeah, it is, it is a really challenging industry to operate within you have pretty small profit margins um uh but you know that is one of the reasons why i think it can work as a co-op because you don't have to generate profit you just have to sustain the people involved so you know that it is another reason why i think that they do um they do exist and there are lots of successful examples all over the world but yes there are also lots I would say also that there's work involved. They're not, a, they're not the easy option, yeah? And it's not as easy as walking down the street to Coles and Safeway. But, um, but I mean, sometimes easy isn't, isn't the right way that should go either. I think, I think, I think the, the effort worth it, but I think, I think it takes effort and, um, and perhaps that's, that's for sure as well. <laughs> yeah, a few, of our, a few of our farmers are piping up. Um, Joe from WA had a question about another food hub. Joe, would you like to ask that question? Uh, hi. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> uh, um, that in relation to the Witchcliff Eco Village, is that what you? Sure. Mm -hmm. Questions, but um, yeah. Look, we're um, I work for the Witchcliff Eco Village. We're just starting up in uh, Margaret River. In um, we're looking to put in the food hub um, as part of uh, the, the eco village. We're about and eighty dwellings here, so a thousand people living there. I guess I'm just starting to do some preliminary research into what the business models, potential business model, might be for that. So I was just probably asking a pretty obvious question as to whether or not a co-op would be an obvious um, potential business model for that. Just wondered if anyone had any comment. No. Okay. <laughs> um, what What do you mean by business models? Where What point are you at? Uh, right at square one. So we we haven't even one. built the we haven't even built it yet. I'm I'm basically just trying to um, yeah, do some research and swat up myself on what 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 are the kind of business models we could choose to go down. Whether or not I mean I imagine it would be a um a um a a venue where we would have a whole raft of different sorts of food businesses as well as an organic packing shed, maybe um, value adding processing manufacturing um, facility at, at a small scale, potentially like a kombucha brewery you were talking about. Um, we, we have agricultural lots that will be part of the um, eco village. So it would be mm -hmm. for the small scale, high value crops. Um, those producers, a place for them to come and sell their um, produce, uh, initially to the eco village um, community and then to the wider region so we're kind of looking at it as it being a, a eventually being a food distribution network mm. sort of place where chefs can come at margaret rivers if you don't know is a quite a tourism region yeah it is so no, it sounds quite, yeah it sounds quite amazing as an idea I'm like trying to work out yeah what how best to set it up and um yeah I guess, yeah. I mean, you could definitely, it could be a, um, I mean, if everyone wanted to run their own little show, but I think, and you could have like a collective relationship of that, or or you could run it as a cooperative, work on a cooperative where all of the moving parts, the people are doing, and then you could, you know, if it was all one strong work on cooperative with just different veins, different capacities, different um, branches, because you, someone loves doing the brewery and someone really loves doing the, the, the meat work or, yeah, if, if there's passions there, um, then it, I guess it, it depends on the people, really, because it's, it's you've got to build a vessel that the people are comfortable in. 
yeah, yeah. and the people trust yeah. so if it's if it's everyone owning their own um, and, and and people are invested in in a, the, in a way that feels fair as well um, I think one of the other things that you can do in the cooperative is you can kind of set up a bit of a price parity as well you can say okay so we, we want to keep our price, our wages between the ages, between kind of like $25 an hour and $75 an hour. Yeah, that's the kind of the scale that we will pay each other different types. So, so packing fruit and veg maybe gets you 25 bucks an hour, but, you know, running the strategy for the entire organisation maybe gets you $7 an hour. Yeah, just to make that kind of like... If, you, if you're doing staff, if you're doing it, it that, in that kind of way, yeah? So yeah. recognising there's different skills in different places that have different earning capacities. So when you're um, building something like that, though, that kind of, I mean, it's a huge, that's a big, strong vision you've got there. And, where, yeah. and where's, it, where's it come from? Like, who's that, who created that vision? Um, so the, the, the project is a uh, joint venture development. Um, so it's, it's developer-led. Um, so there's a sort of a silent investor and then um, the company that I work for is Sustainable Settlements. So mm -hmm. um, it's a residential community, but it's a lot more than that. There's, there's a whole public realm. There's a, there's a commercial precinct. The food hub will be um, part of that. We're going to have a creative hub as well for sort of innovation sort of things. So, yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot going on. But the food yeah. hub, um, I'm the communications and marketing manager there, but my real passion lies in food. So... I want to transition into the food hub. So I guess I'm just starting to do some preliminary research to try and work out yeah. how that might be set up. So, yeah. Yeah. It's a lot so, to do. No, it's a lot to do, but also <laughs> yeah. you don't have the people yet. And What's you can't happening? ever, you don't, no, have, you the don't have the people yet. yet. No. So the people are core to cooperatives. Yeah. I think you can't the people do, that live in the eco village are going to be. I mean, eco villages, by their very definition, are values aligned. Um, they are. So yeah. I think the people that are going to be coming into the eco village are going to be very uh, aligned yeah. with this sort of. Have, um, have you started any, any of that process yet? Have you started seeing anybody yet who wants to like expressions of interest or? Oh yeah, we've we've um, we're, we've just started sales in stage one. So okay, cool. We've literally, yeah. yeah. Well, it's a nice pitch to actually pitch to to people who are buying land and yeah. having a small agriculture plots inside that. That's a really powerful pitch, right? So you, the people who to show up for that, yeah, you've actually got quite a, a powerful offering if, yeah. the, if that's their bent. But um, but it does mean the within co-ops whether or not there's um, so we would have potentially re retail operators and then maybe mm. um, little small scale farmers who might just say. They have a hectare agriculture lot and they just want to get blueberries and they want to sell their blueberries through the food yep. hub. Different types just, of people that might want to get involved. So. Just to jump in, Joe, we, as the ABSA organisation, will most likely run a, a follow-up session on this to delve deeper into um, co-ops, which, if you remember, you're more than welcome to be part of. Um, I might just circle back to a question. We're right on seven now. I, I don't know if, if our panel's happy to stick around. There can be a few more questions. But I did just want to ask... Um, back to what something something that Catherine mentioned that um, for Friends of the Earth for Genevieve is there um, any way that that you found in your experience where there where you can help sustain workers and members those that sort of visit the food co-op um, and encourage people to support co-ops as in um, how do you encourage people to not take the easy option that Catherine mentioned? Um, I think sorry I wasn't my battery had read out, but Catherine, was the easy option like going to the supermarket? Is that, yep. is that yeah. <laughs> yeah, which I was sad to say that, you know, we are competing against that and a and, uh, culture of convenience, I guess. Um, I think you encourage that by fostering a true sense of community and that they, that people who come and participate in the co-op, whether they're a member, whether they're a volunteer. Um, that was actually the other thing I didn't mention. We run a really huge volunteer program without which we would really struggle to function. Um, whether they're, yeah, a, a shopper, um, whatever they are, they are feeding into part of something that's bigger than themselves and it's something that they want to support. Um, it's something that they 
feel that by supporting, uh, it, it makes them feel good. It makes them feel like they're doing something for the planet. They're feeding back into their own community. Um, so I think if you appeal to those reasons, and I think that people are becoming more aware of the necessity of community and true community, um, and that if we have more options, you know, it's about providing people the option to shop at the co-op. I know we're only in one little spot. There aren't, there's a few dotted around, but there's not many. But if you had more, it gives people the option to have this alternative system of shopping and consuming um, their basic needs. So I think it's tricky because it's like we need more co-ops um, to service the community, but then the community needs to feed into them and consumers also have to vote with their dollar. Uh, things are driven by consumers. So if, can, if people want co-ops, they need to support them, they need to shop there. Um, and I'd say that the best thing to do is to appeal to people's sense of community. It all sort of feeds back into itself in a way. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you for that contribution. I guess before we wrap up, I'd love to ask our panelists if there are any uh, resources or any sort of recommendations that you can um, mention, um, directories or the like that people can, can find out ways to support their local co-ops. Uh, the bccm.co um, is a strong set of powerful resources there. Earthworker, cooperative.com.au, um, mm -hmm. earthworkerenergy.co. Uh, is the manufacturing and redgum.coop, I think. I guess redgum.coop is us. Wonderful. Great. We'll, we'll, we'll put hyperlinks. Yeah, we can share hyperlinks when, when we publish this. Cam, Genevieve? Um, oh, sorry. Um, I am not sure if there's a directory of food co ops, but um, food co-ops, as we mentioned before, could sometimes start as buying groups and there's definitely quite a few of them. I would suggest if you're trying to find like-minded people, it's like punching into Google your region and buying group if food co-op is not showing up anything because I know there are quite a lot of buying groups popping up. We get re um, requests from them quite regularly and that's a really good sort of starting point for a co-op could grow out of a buying group because um, then you have that core people involved and with the same vision and then that can grow so that would be a good place to start great Okay, wonderful. Well, thanks so much for your explanations and your examples that you've given us tonight on alternative um, economic structures to capitalism, that is cooperatives, um, and the ways in which that they're working to support people, families, um, and their local communities. We really do appreciate it. I would like to also, uh, Tammy Jonas, our, um, our, the president of, of the Australian Food Sovereignty Alliance, is gonna jump on now just to do a quick um, hello, goodbye and then I can finish it off. Tam, you there? Hello, everyone. Yay! I, just, I want to say such an enormous thank you. Um, I'm sorry that I was late. I was in a much more boring meeting uh, <laughs> with the members of ASEAN and the FAO about the COVID response for Southeast Asia. Um, mm -hmm. and not like this. And arriving here to hear your, your um, wisdom and, and hearing all three of you share your experience has been really brilliant and, and a constant reminder why all of us who are doing this work need to keep activating the work because the opportunity is here and it's going to pass us by if we don't keep amplifying the, the work that we're doing. And what all of you are doing is so inspiring, like Friends of the Earth and Earthworkers has been going for long enough that you, it's not a pipe dream or what comes after capitalism, it's already happening. And so thank you for sharing your knowledge and wisdom about how to do that. You're already crushing capitalism. I'm delighted to be alongside you, hoping I can help. So Yay. thank you on behalf of AFSA for coming along and sharing all of that. It's been great. Nice. Thank you. Thanks, Tam. Great. So yes, I mean, if you if you aren't members of AFSA yet, please head to afsa.org.au. This is the kind of work we do and the space that we agitate and, and the way we try and bring connections. So we'd love your support. Um, we have another webinar next week um, where uh, speaking with artists' family 
um, on replacing growth with belonging economy. So if you're free next Wednesday, the 1st of July, join us again at 6 p.m. Um, I hope to see you all there. Thanks, everyone. Oh, turn your cameras on if everyone would like to say good goodbye. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Ciao, ciao.